Hey folks, Garrett Monroe here for How Does Technology Affect Culture? Glad you could join us today online. Today we're going to be looking at a, uh, an understanding and an analysis of our cultural associations between technology and culture. And we're going to be do sorry, technology and progress. And we're going to be doing that from an ethnographic uh, perspective and so what is an ethnographic perspective you may be familiar with this you may you may you maybe won't you maybe haven't been and so getting into that uh, as a definition here on this screen this is just one way of doing cultural studies um, ethnographic research is a qualitative method where we observe or researchers observe and interact with participants in a real-life environment so we're actually in the field observing and interacting um, so people often people did this popularized in like the 19th century as we were encountering people from different countries and cultures and trying to understand who they were and what they cared about and how their culture worked. And there was a sort of an emerging um, appreciation for how powerful culture is and how diverse human cultures are and how vital it is uh, to how people live. Um, so it's used in a variety of social sciences beyond cultural studies such as sociology and so forth. Um, the, what are the methods of it? Well, it's an approach where you look at people in their cultural setting with the goal of producing a narrative account of what a particular culture, uh, of, of a particular culture against a theoretical backdrop. So we try to uh, interview people and, and hear what they have to say, observe what they do and so forth to get a sense for what they care about. Um, so it's an old, old school way of, of understanding culture. It's been uh, developed and applied in a variety of settings. This is from Sh Edgar Schein, who looks at organizational culture. So that is kind of microculture of businesses, microculture of entrepreneurship, microculture of workplaces. And he breaks it down into three manageable levels. So this is applications beyond just understanding critically culture, but also pragmatically, how do you manage culture? How do you build culture? And this, this model is often called the iceberg model because this top level artifacts and creations, that is the material culture of a place, is visible. So it's above the water, like the tip of an iceberg. So this is our technology, this is our art, this is our audible behavior, um, these are sort of rituals and routines we have, these are how the office space is organized, how the house is organized, how a city is organized. You know, who is, who is in the nice place, who is in not the nice place, how are things connected, uh, how do you get from A to B. Um, the next level, which is beneath the surface of the water here, this is the larger part of the iceberg, which is unseen, are sort of our values. These are things that are espoused, that is expressed directly. Um, we have sort of a greater level of awareness of these things, that is to say, how do we, well, how do we are explain why we do a thing? What do we say to people who ask us, what do you care about? What is our mission? Um, what is the organizational mission, our business mission, and so forth? What do the documents say? Uh, what do the plans say? Um, so this might be what is what is espoused in a place of worship, you know, by a preacher. What is it we're trying to do? Um, what, what people talk about around a kitchen table in moments of sort of earnest disclosure. Uh, these are things that people can say. They have some awareness of it, or at least they, they say they're trying to do a certain thing. These are our values, such as family, or uh, wealth, or sustainability, or something like this. Honesty, perhaps, or um, productivity. Uh, and then there's the deepest and largest level of culture. This is taken for granted, invisible and almost unconscious or pre-conscious. That is to say, we don't even question this. It's simply what is understood to be the way things work. That is, in business, that it should be profitable. Hey, we're here to make money. We're here to uh, produce value. And these are the basic assumptions. What is our relationship to the environment, our nature of reality, time and space? Uh, how does it work? Wh wh how do we live? Nature of human nature, activity and relationships. So what's fascinating is that, in fact, these things do vary and are dependent upon nature, and which is dependent upon, which, which is from where culture arises from. And so using this model, we can begin to see connections across the levels and do some fun analysis. And so, yeah, I like to look at photographs of trends and try to do a, a kind of um, ethnographic or shiny and uh, Edgar Shiny and uh, cultural analysis. And so there's, there's two photographs I want to look at. And I'd, 
I'd love your input on this in your blog post. Um, you're going to be writing one for this module. Uh, the first one is rolling coal. You might be familiar with this trend. Rolling coal, you see these large trucks, these diesel trucks, which have actually been modified. The, the owner um, modifies the engine to spew black smoke. They modify it so that it, it isn't cleaning um, the diesel fuel as much. I'm not exactly sure the technical uh, process by which it works, but essentially the idea uh, this physical action of modifying your truck and showing off um, uh, burning fuel very dirtily um, is a kind of cultural phenomenon we see. It's a physical phenomenon that um, is a kind of display that some people put forth. What is the uh, so that's our vi our physical material visible culture? And the next level is of course. Uh, what are the values? Why would they say they do this? And, and if you might interview these people, I'd be curious to hear what they say. I, I bet they'd say something like, um, I'm free to do what I want, right? I'm not going to be regulated by the government. I'm not going to be regulated by the EPA. Or maybe they're saying, you know, uh, people, uh, environmental conservationists are being alarmist. There's actually not a real problem in the environment. Pollution isn't a problem, perhaps. Uh, and so you might, you might um, stumble upon a number of these things, or they're trying to simply uh, peacock, as they say, kind of make a lot of noise, um, draw a lot of attention to themselves, and kind of show off this piece of expensive diesel machinery they've purchased and modified. Maybe they're showing off their mechanical skills. They might just say, hey, I'm part of a club now. Um, of course, the deeper level, the, uh, the deepest level here is, of course, what is... Uh, what is uh, the assumption of how things operate? And the assumption here, of course, you know, from, from folks who do this is, is probably one about personal liberty uh, and kind of an in-group in terms of I'm a part of a certain group and not a part of another group and I wanna physically display that. I have a will over the environment. My personal, um, pri I prioritize myself and my personal belongings, my power of expression over others or over the environment. Um, and or even myself over the government, right? Because modifying this is there's actually very strict regulations in terms of emissions. You probably know this. I was talking to somebody the other day about an e-check, and so the assumption here is that the government doesn't matter, uh, and I don't care about regulations. I, I'm here essentially uh, to pursue a kind of pursue my own happiness and pursue my own sort of libertarian. Uh, mindset, so to speak. So this is a kind of ethnographic analysis, and you of course do a whole paper and study these people and interview them, and that would be a much better way of doing it. On the other end of the spectrum, we might look at the tiny house movement. The tiny house movement you might be familiar with um, is one about being off-grid. That is to say, as you can see in the photograph, we're looking at physical objects such as solar panels and water heaters, um, solar water heaters, generating electricity. We don't see any pipes or wires running to this place, so it probably has a composting toilet, its own internal closed system for water and septic and so forth. And so these material objects point to um, a deeper level of values of sustainability, of independence, of self-reliance, and of course in a connection with nature, right, of being removed from uh, ma uh, urban culture uh, and, and dense culture and perhaps not wanting to be dependent on other th other people or things or resources and kind of manage their own footprint, manage their own environmental footprint. Um, uh, similar overlaps here in terms of individualism and so forth, but very different f forms of expression. They're both done through technology, right? We're talking about um, expressions from within our modern uh, technological culture of s a skilled expression of mastery of of technology, and so they're done in different ways with perhaps different values under different assumptions about, or maybe or maybe somewhat related assumptions. And so you could really spend some time analyzing um, cultural phenomena or photographs in that way. I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to find a photograph of something you find interesting or you don't quite understand, and do an analysis using this model of organizational culture. Look at the physical artifacts, um, maybe it's a piece of technology or a piece of art, and do some analysis or a pattern or a behavior and, and try to uncover what the values are, the espoused values, and what the basic assumptions might be there.
So we're going to do this. So I'd like to do that in a blog post. We're going to do this at a deep level today. And we're going to do this by um, uncovering and mapping our deepest, uh, our Western culture, American culture, deep association between technology and progress. That is to say, oftentimes we associate at a very deep level that technology is progress, that it is good and it should be pursued and developed. Um, this is a deep level assumption that is uh, that is in our cultural understanding and it has deep and powerful roots. And so that's what we'll be kind of mapping today. And just to go back a minute at the matrix metaphor here, we have this wonderful photograph of Neo first receiving his Nokia cell phone um, as he's just beginning to leave the matrix, just beginning to wake up to the reality uh, from which he's operating. And that is exactly the metaphor I like with thinking about cultural studies. That is to say, Neo here is about to step out of his culture, step out of his reality and find that um, there's other ways of being um, and perhaps the, uh, the, the culture with which, the system with which he was operating within was constructed. Um, and while this course is not suggesting that re reality is human, it, it is const artificially constructed, it is nonetheless, um, humans have contributed to the culture we've built. Uh, we have we have agency. It hasn't just sort of happened out of nowhere. And powerful people and other people have uh, normal people have uh, collectively created the culture with which we live in. And so um, that's a sort of doorway into starting to think about our association between technology and culture. And so by the end of this module, you will produce a blog post about 250 words reflecting on what progress means to you. What is your personal sense of the good life? What is your wider social sense of the good life? That is to say, beyond your own life and your own family, what do you think the good life looks like for uh, your community or your nation or however you want to associate? And society, and what is a society that is progressing? What disconnect do you see between that vision and our current actions? That is to say, uh, do, does your is your daily routine um, uh, trending in this direction? Or, uh, or not, a and is your sense of the good life perhaps different from what the dominant view or the received view of culture that has been handed to us is? Are we operating under an operating system which maybe we don't necessarily agree with? That might be the case. Uh, or perhaps you associate with a, a particular subculture. I would like to know um, where you're at with this in the 250 word blog post. And by the way, this is connected with your midterm experiment uh, or project of analyzing your cell phone use. So this should all be helpful in terms of building that project and thinking through that project. Okay, so how do we define progress? What does progress mean to us? And there's this wonderful story, of course, of the Titanic, popularized by the movie. Uh, nine, which was not the movie launched in 1912, but the, the actual ship was launched in 1912, and it was held up as the symbol of ultimate progress, this unsinkable, expertly designed, incredibly powerful thing, which was also associated with luxury and class and, and prag pragmatic sort of um, efficacy over the, uh, over the world. It was, it was talked about, this is, a, this is from a newspaper article which was um, analyzing and celebrating sort of the design of the Titanic. And so um, we've, th you know, this, this course is really beginning to wonder to what extent is technology associated, such as cell phones, with a better world and to what extent, you know, uh, it, 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 it makes that happen. And so we're gonna be looking at what progress means, the US story that is the frontier going back two, 300 years and the industrial revolution. And we're going to look at how progress has been used by different groups and individuals to sell us something. That is to say they've weaponized or utilized this story of, of technological progress uh, as a way to market things and to dominate other people, such as to, to put them in uh, working conditions and so forth, to control populations. And um, what does it mean to stand in the way of progress? So that's sort of an overview of this section. And so here are some more of these really fantastic photographs of men, people working on the Titanic uh, 1912 here. And this is the sort of dwarfing the size of them. And and, uh, and then, of course, there were other stories in, in, um, 
in uh, the story of, of progress, which began to pump the brakes, right? The sinking of the Titanic just shocked people, as did, you know, the great age of airships, the great age of dirigibles, with the, the famous Hindenburg here crashing, which is the most iconic photograph uh, of the early 20th century, one of them at least, um, of the, uh, the, the helium here exploding and people just running from it, which stopped <laughs> the whole trend of building... Um, not helium, sorry, the hydrogen, uh, hydro explosive hydrogen gas here exploding. People just stopped building these after this. It really changed the public's opinion. But we still associate very powerfully, very powerfully, um, high technology, technological achievements as symbols of progress. And SpaceX today, or our space programs, are certainly one of those. Um, for different people, this means different things. Uh, and yet it seems like this ability to engineer and to reach new heights is something that captures our collective imagination. And certainly Kennedy did that really powerfully in the 60s with his um, uh, space program and the moon race. Today it still certainly does. And Elon Musk does this very effectively by associating his rocket company, SpaceX, with Tesla electric motors and so selling cars in that way. Um, but how do we define progress? Uh, you know, progress is defined as something that means to move forward on your way. It implies a direction or a goal, an end point, right? Are we getting there? Are we getting there yet? How far are we along? Are we ahead of other people? You might think about progressing disease, right? A disease is progressing towards its terminal point, uh, its mortality point. It kind of consuming someone. Of course, this is a morbid uh, and pejorative metaphor for it. Um, and Robert Nisbet here, a cultural studies thinker, uh, quoted here, simply stated the idea of progress, hold that mankind has advanced in the past. That is to say, we are further ahead than we were in the past. We're superior to those people from some aboriginal condition of primitiveness, barbarianism, or even nullity. It's now advancing and will continue to advance through the foreseeable future. That is to say, we are better than people in the past. We are more evolved. Uh, we are further along. And it even assumes perhaps that tech uh, cultures that are more progressed uh, have um, are better than other ones, right? Perhaps they're smarter than other ones. Uh, and it gives them license to dominate others or look down their nose at others or indeed change other cultures. Um, and so this really capture, this is really often expressed as a march towards a utopia, this image here on the right, the, sh the shining city on the hill, the good life. How do we, pro progressing towards the perfect society and technology has always, always been associated with that. Um, well, not always, but since more or less the Industrial Revolution, you know, often we can look at this and think, uh, you know, be, we could do an analysis before the U.S. and really look at how the good life was often um, expressed prior to the Industrial Revolution as a moral project, as a spiritual prog uh, project. And that is, of course, the idea of the city on the hill it comes from the Bible, from Christianity. But it isn't just Christianity that's um, talked about progress in moral and spiritual terms. All of them certainly do. Um, so progress shows us, you know, in some sense, where we've come from, how far we've come, and where we think we're going. Uh, and so the goals of progress, um, you know, unstated, really. This is the assumed level, that bottom level of the iceberg, that the, that the good, we're progressing towards a better life for everybody. You know, family, community, happiness, leisure, health, wealth harmony, adventure, accumulate nice things, beautiful things, things that are meaningful to us. It, it oftentimes for people in the U.S. means a material betterment, a moral betterment, um, and it, it creates comfort, convenience, right? Maybe perhaps tolerance. Uh, and this is from 1928, Hoover, a pin from his political campaign, a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And what we can look at chicken every pot, of course, means health and well-being, um, comfort and car in every garage, mobi social mobility, ownership, right? Moving up through the social classes, being able to get what you want. That's, of course, he's capturing here the uh, some sense of the American dream. 
uh, it's often associated with the absence of war or violence, right? We want peace, spiritual enlightenment, often conflated new with progress. And so uh, oftentimes we do mix up something as being new and shiny, innovative, brand new, cutting edge, and saying, oh, that must be progress, right? So um, we often assume that if it's new, it works better and it's further along, and that's not always the case, right? And we can certainly point to self, certain aspects of cell phones or certain aspects of electronic culture as uh, emblems of that point. Email is a great one. Uh, it makes life better in some sense. We're able to more quickly and more efficiently do our work versus paper mail, paper memos, or walking around, or mailing things, you know. Um, and yet, uh, it, we lose something with email, certainly. Uh, uh, a sense of community, a sense of connection, a tone, of course, you know. When is it appropriate to text versus when is it appropriate for a phone call or an in-person conversation? They're not all the same. And so doing everything via email might actually, uh, you know, or doing a completely paperless office might actually, in the, in the big picture, not be great for the business if people, workers who constitute that office begin to become disassociated from it. Not, not as happy, you know, being sort of absorbed in this digital matrix versus living something, uh, uh, you know, work, being in a workplace which is, feels a little closer to our human nature, which might be uh, kind of more social. Um, and yet, you know, this assumption is like, let's try the new thing out, the newest cell phone, the newest car, and so and so forth. So these assumptions behind progress being uh, new and progress is that um, it's assumed. It's never stated anywhere. Nobody's saying these things. And yet it's it's certainly there in the cultural milieu that um, that's how it works. And that's where the power comes from, because... If it's stated directly, it's easy to tear down or analyze, as we're doing here. But if it's not, you know, if it's just an assumption, if it's sort of under the water, then um, it's harder to uh, it's harder to tear down and see. So it operates without being explicit. Um, so what we need to do is sort of untangle these associations uh, and establish criteria for measuring progress, right? Instead of sort of taking and absorbing what other people are giving us, we need criteria for what progress is. How do we measure it? Is more better? Are more cars uh, uh, in the U.S. a better thing? Are more is more technology? Are more things always uh, higher technology always a better thing for people? For us, uh, how many people have smartphones? Um, how many? How much beef are we producing? How many chickens are in those pots? <laughs> So we need to establish a yardstick, uh, but this is, of course, hard to measure uh, things that we often pursue in terms of the good life, like betterment, like happiness, harmony, morality, spirituality. These are not things that are easy to measure. It's much easier to measure things like cell phones, uh, cattle, cars, countable material objects like technology. And so that's often what we do. We look at uh, economic um, indicators and data and GDP, and we say, "Ha! There's growth. We have growth. We have, uh, you know, so much of our of our political policy and economic policy is based on our sort of material head counting of things, and we're not really measuring things according to." Oftentimes what people really are interested in, which isn't just the accumulation of things or the growth of wealth, it's certainly important, but a lot of these other more difficult things to measure. And that is, of course, uh, the real bugbear, the real uh, uh, worm at the core of, uh, of, of this issue. So we lose sight of the qualitative in favor of the quantitative, there's the countable things. We've gotten really good at improving things we can count cell phones and screens and televisions. Look at the progress of televisions and screens over the last few decades. When I was a kid, TVs and computers were massive boxes of things. They had magnets in them. They sparked to life. Um, you didn't want to have your face too close to them. <laughs> they were expensive. They were, you know, the, the, it was almost like a diesel uh, engine. You, you had TV re electronic repair people who lived down the road who worked on these things. Certainly not the case anymore. The whole system is designed around global, disposable, light, um, incredibly high definition screens now flat screens and so forth and yet there's so much little progress we've made on many other indications of what humans often 
um, say they value or think they value. Uh, so uncountable things are hard to improve, these things that we can't count. And so Kevin Kelly here, only intangible, only intangible like meaningful happiness uh, count. Meaningfulness is very hard to measure, which makes it hard to optimize. And so that's certainly part of the problem. So certainly we can see here a graph of the evolution of technology adoption and usage. You know, we're, we've gotten very good at spreading the internet and technology and uh, cell phones. It's certainly gone almost to a ubiquitous point. This is from the Pew Research Center. So more technology is often used as, uh, and new technology is often used as a yardstick for progress. So this is, uh, this really goes back, the roots of this really go back to the Enlightenment. Um, so this is a term in Western history, uh, history of thought to an intellectual and cultural movement in the 18th and 19th century, priorita prioritizing rationality over tradition. And so... Um, this was, uh, you're probably familiar with this if, you, if you've taken many history courses, uh, but this is sort of a move away, and this is where the birth of the U.S. nation, of course, came from, which was a move away from kings and queens dominating nation states, right? People who um, said that they were uh, empowered by God or from a certain family that was better than everybody else, and they said that this is how the country will rule, to a way of moral... Uh, a way of organization which was based on democracy, that is, vote, representational democracy, which is say, let's debate things, let's figure out what's best, what the people want, and let's study science, try to get facts, let's move away from a culture dominated by superstition and religion and the few into a place which was about uh, debating things and so forth. So this was a real, a real moment in Western thought or perhaps even global thought, um, that, that identified objectivity, rationality, efficiency as positive and noble values. And certainly we can agree with a lot of this. We value science, so we value its application. Today that's certainly true. And its application is often uh, technology. Um, and so this often means progress, right? More of this, more science, more technology is often, uh, we assume, is better. Um, we value efficiency. We want more. We want things to be more efficient, as efficient as possible. This is valued. Maximized output, minimized work and resources. This sounds great. Um, and for many, technology embodies the modern idea of applying rationality to the betterment of humankind. So technology is sort of the child of science, and it has deep sort of associations with, uh, uh, with progress. And that's, of course, part of our... American underpinnings, and of course we have, you know, part of the Enlightenment was where some of these these thinkers, these French thinkers like Voltaire here, think for yourself and let others enjoy the privilege of doing so too. And so this is cer certainly some of the something that Americans often agree with, right? Independent thought, self-expression, and uh, and so freedom of speech and so forth. So one criteria we've often established uh, is efficiency. The efficiency is progress. Can we be more efficient, such as a car's fuel economy, um, or work efficiency and productivity? We oftentimes do a cost-benefit analysis. And this is often tied to profit. Uh, Frederick Taylor is famous for setting up his efficiency studies in the early 1900s on factories as the Industrial Revolution was taking hold in the U.S. Um, and he really wanted to maximize how workers were doing their tasks. Um, and this is, of course, uh, Henry Ford, how, how, how we built interchangeable parts, individuals within the factory were scaled to a certain point that people could maximize just one job and the humans became part of the machine. And this was the most efficient and affordable way of producing goods, quality goods. And, uh, you know, I mean, workers often were celebrated this because it got them steady work, oftentimes better paying work than before, cleaner work than, you know, toiling away um, in the fields or or so forth or um, and you know the great uh, the great sort of achievement of Henry Ford was having a place where uh, employing workers to a point where they could buy the, the cars that were produced in that factory and yet um, the the way in which work began to evolve wasn't always something that was desirable uh, after a while and so Weber of course in the 20s is famous in sociology uh, for criticizing bureaucratic organizations. And if we become sort of these hyper-specialized, compartmentalized individuals, don't we become sort of specialists without spirits? 
sensu sensualists without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. And so uh, Weber is sort of saying, look, if, if, if we establish efficiency in human organization as a yardstick of progress, we eventually get to a point where we're no longer really human. We're no longer really uh, happy in these roles. I don't, and we've sort of lost a bit of our spirit and our heart in, in terms of working this way. You can certainly a certain reminiscent of office space and other ways of becoming sort of humans, cogs in the machines. Um, and this sort of puts humans as a resource, right? A human resource that we are uh, part of a system, a network uh, of a superstructure producing goods. Um, and so this led to complaints of dehumanization of workers. And this is when we get into a bit of Marx, Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto. Uh, that's not 1948, this should be 1848, a little bit of a typo there, my bad. This is a, a ways back. And of course, speaking um, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, they were really keen on this. Um, and so, uh, you know, he, he said, look, look, part of the part of the problem with the industrial system, the, ca the class-based system where we have workers and owners, is that workers become, uh, we lose our, a lot of element of our humanity here. And... The extension of this sort of efficiency looks at replacing humans with machines. Machines are less work than humans. They oftentimes take less uh, resources to maintain. They're more efficient. And so often eventually, Marx said, humans would be replaced by machines. And certainly that was, tr <laughs> was true in the 1840s. We're still seeing that today as automation, in fact, is replacing most jobs in the U.S., not outsourcing or something else like this. It seems to be robots and so forth replacing work. And so there does seem to be this widespread cultural commitment to scientific objectivity and efficiency. And so technology can be seen as the driving force of progress. Uh, indeed, if you begin to try to argue against progress in technology, if you start, if you become off, and you might even be getting some of this, like, oh, what is Garrett on about here? Uh, of course technology is progress. Of course it's better. Do you want us to go back to a primitive state? Um, there's this sort of moral imperative implied with technology and culture. And if you argue against it, um, people say, you can't. It's simply inevitable. We will progress. Things will move forward. It simply has to be, we have to find a way to make, to make do with the advance of technology. We're taught to accept the things in this culture in the name of progress, even if it's harmful to many things we care about. And so the story of progress in American culture is, is fascinating. Carrie and Quick talk about the birth of the American nation as dreamed up by Europeans before it was discovered by Columbus. Even in, even in the 15 and 1600s, uh, Europeans were thinking about in, an escape to some kind of nature-bound utopia. How do we get away from these disease-ridden and dirty uh, urban environments that were developing in Paris and London and so forth? Um, they were looking for a balance between industrialization and nature. How do we get the best of both worlds? Both uh, efficiency, technological progress, and the beauty of the natural environment between work and days. How do we both get uh, our, our, our bread and enjoy our sky. Europe had a long and violent history before America. America was seen as a place to start afresh from empires, from royalty, from oppressors. It was seen as a new Eden, no pollution or crowds. We see this in the, the uh, Pocahontas story, of course, right? <laughs> Chesapeake Bay, um, befriending the uh, Native Americans and so forth. And, of course, a place of immense material resources to draw on for industry and for war. And this was the mercantile system, the colonial system that was utilized by uh, European powers. Uh, revolution was based on European Enlightenment principles, democracy, freedom, and liberty, echoed in the French Revolution, uh, but occurred in the New World. Jefferson, of course... Um, wanted to let workshops remain in Europe. He was look, they were looking at creating a new kind of economy. Marx wrote about the vision of the U.S., the America, as the machine in the garden, nature and technology in harmony. Um, and Jefferson and Franklin knew a delicate balance had to be struck, and that industry would come. They knew that it was inevitable, even though young America wasn't all that industrial. It was more of an agrarian uh, based economy and, a, and an export natural resource based economy 
Indeed, Franklin didn't even take out patents on his inventions, thinking these ideas should be shared lest they become hyper-industrialized and utilized. And yet, for all this goodwill and good thinking about balance and harmony, eventually, into the 18th century, the young second generation of Americans, the lure and the wealth <laughs> uh, became too great. And we began rapidly industrializing, building railways and canals, connecting states and expanding west. This was seen as a good in themselves, a cause of wealth and expansion. And of course, we have the great Ralph Waldo Emerson writing, What have these me mechanic arts done for character but the worth of mankind? Are men better? Tis too, plain, tis too plain that with the material power, the moral progress has not kept pace. It appears that we have not made a judicious investment. Works and days were offered. We took works. There's a wonderful, wonderful story uh, in some of this thinking about, you know, a man or a person could work uh, all day to buy a ticket to get to on the railway to get to another city. Or instead of working to buy the ticket, he could just walk and be there in a day. And so uh, there's sort of this and, and through the walk, enjoy himself or themselves much more than through the work. Um, and so this is sort of a criticism, even in the mid-19th century, uh, of the industrialization of the U.S. And of course, this expansion west to the frontier gave a geographic dimension to the feeling of progress. We have the idea of manifest destiny, which you're probably familiar with. That is to say, we're ordained by God to cover the continent. It is, uh, it is because the continent is of, of a certain shape. Excuse me. Shape. The U.S. has a right and a will to go and expand, and this has underpinnings in evangelical Protestantism, um, Calvinism. Uh, that is to say, the the belief in in a predestination. That is, there is a destiny. There is the will of God, which is preset. We all kind of have a, a, a course that God has determined, and this is applied at a national level. That uh, the the U.S. is to become the shape of the continent. We are to become. The whole geographical space, the the way in which God made the land, is the way in which the country should look. And the U.S. is God's chosen land. This was certainly a part of the thinking of the industrialists and the the nineteenth century uh, workers as well. And this is wonderfully seen in this, you know, doing some ethnographic thinking in this in this painting. This is John Gast, eighteen seventy two. This is. Uh, the Austri or the Autry Museum of the American West and its oil on canvas. And we see Lady Liberty here, right, with her book. Um, moving, uh, or a school book here, bringing with her in her left hand <laughs> the power line, the electrical line, as we come from the Chesapeake Bay out to the West. And what are our, you know, she's leading the railway here. We've got the stagecoach who's pushing into the frontier. We've got white settlers with their tools, their oxen, their, their hunters at the very forefront. And we're pushing, of course, Buffalo and Native Americans uh, further west. And you can see the weather sort of shifting here as well from sort of calm and peaceful to stormy and so forth. The, the, the uh, propaganda in this is a really explicit, right? This was <laughs> a narrative used to... Um, justify what we were doing to Native Americans and uh, uh, a narrative used to entice uh, working class peoples like poor poor whites into becoming um, to, to take big risks and, and, and go west and settle. Of course that great, you know, I mean there was a big reward. They were offered land, uh, the ability to make their own life out west and work the railroad and so forth. And then we have of course 1905 The Jungle Upton Sinclair, you may have read this uh, through your studies elsewhere, was an account of uh, slaughterhouses in uh, Chicago, massive industrial scale meat packing plants, and uh, I have some uh, great grandparents who worked in these meat packing plants in Chicago, and it's a it's a front hand ethnographic journalistic account, somewhat sensational, certainly sensationalized, told as a drama. This sort of thing would make really good TV on Netflix today, kind of of a kin of Ozarks or something like that. It really exposed the unsafe working conditions of factory workers, the inhumanity of working in this place, people losing their limbs, getting sick, living in squalor. And in the end, it, it has the factory workers escaping to the pastoral 
uh, west, going out to the countryside, getting a ticket, and just leaving the smog-ridden, filthy city. So you could see even at the time, people were beginning to, to, uh, to look at this through this ethnographic study of, of the jungle. Um, you know, the Civil War was really an end to the idea of peace and prosperity and unity of the national at a national scale and so we have I'm jumping around a little bit here chronologically but we have this very famous photograph by um, Timothy O'Sullivan 1863 and with technology with the advent of the of the uh, the camera uh, we have for the first time in media in journalism real images coming to the public of what war looks like right and so we have here the harvest of death at Gettysburg PA uh, and it was a photograph of mortality of lives lost in the Civil War and you know that it was such a profound cultural moment for the US in terms of shattering this myth of manifest destiny that we're all sort of humming along progressing along the inevitability of of, of unifying the country that there are in fact deep grievances deep misunderstandings deep oppression and deep disagreement about what our country should look like what is the good like um, and yet, even with that, uh, excitement over technological progress remains strong. Um, we have, into the war years, the Great Depression. Technology management of the economy was seen as the antidote to getting us out of a depression. And um, building dams and bringing electricity. The Hoover Dam in 1936 was, I mean, it's, it's profound to think about the the shift in in life quality of life that happened out west when electricity was brought to people through hydropower imagine no longer having to dig uh, pull water from a well and having that simply done for you um, people love having a radio having electric lights this is what people wanted they wanted to, to to stop sort of toiling in the dust and the dirt and so this was the project massive federal scale uh, infrastructure projects, which really did improve the quality of life for many people, but at some cost, certainly environmental destruction, which we're still sort of figuring out. And we've already sort of, we've always sort of charted a course between the balance of how, you know, how this works. And, and so certainly the, the early uh, ways in which we did industrial technology did have environmental impact, which was not much of a part of the conversation then, although it is, it is certainly today. Um, and so, you know, um, electric electrification was seen as this great thing for many decades, and then it sort of lost its buzz. It lost its glow, and people became enamored with new technologies. They became enamored with people who started to actually um, start to not like coal-fired plants. They didn't like the the pollution. They didn't like the power lines going up everywhere, the hum, and perhaps the radiation. They began they began they began to see. The, the glow of it was lost, and they began to become critical of it. And indeed, the bomb, the atomic development of, of weaponry and so forth, radiation, um, this stuff all eventually does begin to lo lose its glow. But as they're new, especially this is the case of cell phones for the last 10, 15 years, they've had this appeal to them that slowly begins to lose its shimmer. And indeed, digital computers in the 50s began to uh, be the new frontier of technological progress. These, uh, unlike electricity, they didn't replace physical work. Computers replaced work of the mind, calculations. And we have now the development of AI beyond human capabilities, approaching an event called, <laughs> some people call the singularity. And so we won't get into all that now, but the computer certainly has uh, continued to enthrall us today and transform and warp from room-sized devices into devices that fit into our pockets and are with us at all times. Um, so there's, I'm going to pause here and uh, continue on in the next section with two major ideas that underpin this progress story, evolution and the sublime.